All right. Um, welcome to the second lecture in INF 4820, Algorithms for Artificial Intelligence and Natural Language Processing. I'm the other teacher. So my name is uh, Stefan Oeppen. I work jointly with Moorhof in the Language Technology Group here on the seventh floor. Um, only this semester you won't be seeing a lot of me. Um, I'm most of the time on research leave from the department, but I will come in as needed. So um, I'll be holding today's lecture and uh, a lecture this coming week, where I'll try to introduce you to the programming language we'll be using in this course, Common Lisp, and I'll try to motivate you. And more have thought I would be better set up to do that part because I actually program in Lisp a lot. So I'll be sharing from my own experience, and hopefully that will be um, um, engaging and motivating to you. And then um, most of the semester, Mohav will be lecturing, and I come back towards the end of the term. Oh, I should post. So that will be about my own research, which is in syntactic analysis. And we'll get to that at some point. So I'll see you this week, next week, and then, what is it, 10 weeks from now again for to, to wrap up the semester. Um, today I'll try to introduce you to, to a new programming language. I'm assuming it's a new programming language for all, or certainly most of you, Common Lisp. And um, very quickly, we tend to use five minutes or so initially at each lecture to try and recap what happened last week. And last week, Mohav essentially tried to give you some idea of what this very fashionable term, artificial intelligence, it's back in fashion, it's, it's hyped a lot, everything is AI currently. Um, so um, that didn't used to be the case 10 years ago and may not be the case 10 years into the future. Who knows, it's a, it's a, a wave pattern of going into fashion and falling out of fashion. But um, AI, artificial intelligence, has a long history. Um, various computer applications that present themselves as intelligent to some degree, um, where we put intelligent into scarce quotes because um, we haven't really given an, a definition of that. But um, what is currently a big part of AI, the current AI hype, is natural language processing. Our desire to interact with machines, with computers, using our own language, for example, when driving a car or talking to uh, robots. Um, but business intelligence, big data analytics, um, all of these are sub-areas of, of AI. And um, large-scale data processing, machine learning, um, um, search algorithms, uh, statistical, probabilistic modeling, um, those are the, the, I'm sure Mohav presented the three circles last week. Uh, those are the three sort of background areas from which we draw and try to distill one coherent introduction for you. And it boils down to AI for us is essentially a toolkit, a bag of tricks that you can take away and apply to different kinds of hard problems. And today um, we'll um, introduce you to the to the programming language. This is in no small part a programming class. We will use programming exercises to solidify our understanding of the various machine learning techniques and and algorithms that we'll introduce. And um, we don't give you a choice. We want you to do that in Lisp. And today I'll try to motivate that um, that 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 choice that we make for you. Um, Lisp is worth learning for the profound enlightenment experience you will have when you finally get it. So you'll be better citizens when you complete this course. Um, that experience will make you a better programmer for the rest of your days, even if you never actually use Lisp itself a lot. Lisp is at times um, compared to Latin, a language that um, at least many people in the humanities believe will enable you to uh, pursue a certain type of, of, of science. Um, 
I'm German, as you surely can tell from my accent already. So I learned Latin in school in Germany. And um, I think it actually did me some good. I then went on to study languages and just knowing um, the rich, um, complex grammar of Latin enabled me to, to learn other languages um, more easily, I believe, and to eventually become a researcher on grammar, on formal grammar, on the structure of languages. So um, arguably that exposure to Latin in, in school, actually, in my case, um, contributed to that. The analogy is imperfect because Latin is, we can agree, a dead language. There are very few people who speak Latin. Um, Lisp is not. It's often um, said to be more of a dead language than something that is um, the first item you put on your resumes when you apply for an internship at Google. But I think you should include Lisp on that resume because um, there are still many maybe even increasingly so, again, applications of Lisp, um, including in industry, and if you go to the course page, we've posted a few pointers, oops, and sort of, if you don't want to take my word for it, then um, these are some recent blog posts, essentially, that reflect on the status of Lisp as a, a tool an actively used tool in various industries today. So, for example, a lot of the worldwide airline ticketing is driven by a LISP system. Um, so, um, very abstractly, a LISP is a high-level and efficient language with especially strong support for what is often called symbolic and functional programming. And we'll be manipulating mostly natural language data, not numbers. And so symbolic programming, in contrast to numeric programming, is, is something that we'll want to do. Um, it has a, a, a rich, a large standard library, a multitude of built-in data types and operations. It's trivial to learn. That's the point I'll try to make today. It's arguably the programming language that takes the least time to learn. And um, I hope that during the break today already, you'll agree that there's some reason for me to make that claim. It has a trivial syntax, hardly any syntax at all, and a very straightforward semantics, and we'll introduce both in about 15 minutes today. And then you'll know, essentially, the basics of Common Lisp. And it's well suited for something that is, is more and more popular these days, incremental interactive development in contrast to writing your program, compiling it and running it, and then running the debugger after it has crashed. Um, this read, eval, print loop type of interactive development that you also find in, for example, pr Python programming. It's been standardized, um, ANSI standardized since, what is it, uh, the late 1990s, I believe. It's a stable language. It's not a moving target, um, which means there Quite a few strong, mature compilers that generate very efficient code. That's one of the important differences to Python. So many of these things you might say about Python. Um, Python is a scripting language that borrows many of the ideas from Lisp. It doesn't have good compilers today. It doesn't run efficiently. Um, and it's not stable. It keeps evolving. Um, secretly, among ourselves. We also like the fact that many of you know Python, but not everyone does, whereas none of you have much programming experience in Lisp. So using a language that is foreign to everyone kind of levels the playing field. You all start in the same place. We think that's a, a, a useful starting proposition. So these are the sort of high-level marketing points about Lisp. A um, little bit of it about its history. I think you've seen this guy last week already, um, John McCarthy pioneer in artificial intelligence at Stanford University, and developed Lisp not as a programming language, but as a mathematical formal formalism, uh, an attempt to develop a theory of computing, an alternative to um, the work at about the same time by um, Alan Turing. So the so-called lambda calculus that underlies Lisp is a mathematical formalism that McCarthy originally developed to, to 
to formalize, to reason about computing, decidability, those kinds of things, complexity. Um, um, and then one of his students actually kind of accidentally developed a, a compiler on a, a mainframe frame system of, of the time. And so that mathematical formalism actually became a programming language. And um, it preserved the, the, the purity that was built into its design. And since this is now, what, 70 years ago almost, 60-some, uh, there's actually a family of Lisp languages, dialects, if you will, Scheme, Emacs Lisp, the uh, Lisp dialect in which large parts of the Emacs editor are developed and in which you can customize it. Common Lisp is the ANSI standard that we're using here. Um, Clojure is a recent purely functional variant of Lisp that runs on the Java Virtual Machine. There's a dialect called Clojure Script that is gaining some traction as an alternative to JavaScript. It runs in the browser. And um, what is common to, to, to all of these is the underlying, the, the ideas of this mathematical formalism and uh, a bias, let's say, towards functional style programming. We, we won't put a very fine point on that. We'll pick the programming paradigm that suits our problems. So we actually won't be very purist functional, but um, that is part of the, the history of Lisp. And now in a couple of minutes, um, your introduction to common Lisp, and we'll pretend that we have the, the REPL, the interactive prompt where we type in an expression and the system returns to us um, what it computes. That is the value that is computed that is returned for that um, impression. That's the interactive programming environment. Question mark represents the prompt, the arrow, um, what comes back to us. Um, there are atomic data types, uh, numbers, booleans, strings, and they evaluate to themselves. So a string in double quote, quotes comes back as the same string. A number comes back as that same number. Nothing surprising here. So what happens here is that we type in an expression. It's evaluated. It's computed. And what the REPL, the Lisp system, returns to us is the value corresponding to that expression. And T means true. It's the Boolean constant for true. Um, nil is false. And these also evaluate to themselves. So they are the self-evaluating atomic data types. And then there are symbols. We've mentioned symbolic programming. So I can type in the symbol, the identifier, you might say, in some languages, pi. And it has a predefined, it's a predefined constant, so it comes back with its value. So the symbol, um, t and nil are symbols, but they are the Boolean constants, hence they evaluate to themselves. Symbol like pi evaluates to its associated value. It's bound to that value. And this is a predefined binding. If I type in a symbol that doesn't have a predefined value, foo, then what comes back is, strictly speaking, nothing. Nothing comes back. Because foo doesn't have a, a value in, in an empty, in a fresh Lisp environment. And hence, evaluating foo, asking for its value, means that's a request that cannot be satisfied. That gives me an error. Foo is an unbound variable, and the Lisp system cannot return. That's an exception. You should feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any time. Um, and ideally, we'll make this a somewhat interactive session. Um, time permitting, we might even do some live programming towards the end, I think. Um, yes? Um, um, yes, no, I think this says D0. Um, I've actually never noticed this. Um, I think this means this is a double precision floating point number. Um, but it's, it's, I'd rather take it away. It's not something I want to, so different types of numbers I don't want to discuss today. Um, numbers integers, floats, double precision floats, rationals. Um, um, we won't do a lot of numeric computing anyway, but um, 
I think this indicates something about the specific type of number that is the value of pi. <laughs> Nicely spotted. Never noticed. Um, so, um, a little bit of terminology. We'll say that the Lisp pieces of Lisp code are symbolic expressions or S expressions and we'll distinguish two fundamental types of S expressions. The atoms, and we've already seen some atomic expressions, and those that actually have structure and those will take the form of lists. Um, and what is interesting about Lisp is um, that it's what is sometimes called a mono-iconic programming language. It uses the same structures, the same syntax, to represent data and code. That is, the program itself and the data that it manipulates, both will be represented as symbolic expressions, as S expressions. Um, so, here is an S expression that is a, a list. Um, it's bracketed by a pair of, of parentheses. So this is not an atom. We can tell by the pair of, of parentheses. This is a, a list. And lists are used to, uh, to write down um, uh, a function call. So what this means is there's an operator named by the symbol plus, if we try to talk very precisely about what we see here. So this names a function, the addition function. And then there are two arguments, two operands. And when Lisp evaluates uh, a list, a uh, non-atomic S expression, then it interprets the first element of the list as the name of a function. It evaluates all of the remaining elements of the list and then invokes the function on those arguments on those values. And of course we can um, uh, we'll, we'll nest expressions, but before we do that let's observe that this is not the mainstream syntax to write down um, um, arithmetics, arith arithmetic expressions that you might be used to. So um, in, uh, in, 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 in pencil and paper math, we would put the operator between the operands, 1 plus 2. Um, Lisp uses what is called the prefix notation. It moves the operator to the front and that has the great benefit that I can vary the number of arguments. I have the plus function and I can give it from 0 to an arbitrary finite number of arguments. And using this Prefix notation means I don't need to change anything about the syntax. I put the operand in the first place and then all of the arguments can follow. So plus is one of the many functions in Lisp that are uh, that have variable arity. They don't take a fixed number of arguments, but they can take um, a range of uh, there, there, there's a, a possible range of valid numbers of arguments. For plus, that ranges from 0 to an arbitrary n. I can call plus without any arguments. What do you expect should come back there? Error? Then it would not be a valid call to plus. I mean, that would be... So, what's the... the how can it be meaningful to call plus without any arguments? Um, it's, it's 0. So, what comes back is the neutral element of addition. So here already the sort of mathematical approach to designing a programming language shines through. When you call plus without any arguments, then it returns to you zero. You didn't add together anything, so what corresponds to that computation is zero. Um, I don't expect we'll find very many Lisp programs that call the plus function without any arguments or with just one argument, but the prefix notation and the variable arity property uh, uh, makes that possible. So we can nest expressions, um, we can build compound statements, or composite statements, where this means add together 10 and 20 and then divide the result by 2. And 
both operators are written as prefix notation. And if we were to translate that into classic pencil and paper math, what would that be? 10 plus 20 divided by 2, right? Parenthesis. Oh, that's only in Lisp. I need these here too. <laughs> so what's the value of this arithmetic expression? The way it's on the board, 10 plus 20 divided by 2. Uh, 10 plus 10, that's 20. But I claim that the value of the expression over here is 15. So they cannot be the same expression. And hence, as you say, if what we want to do is add before we divide, then we actually need to use parentheses and sort of the, the language of arithmetics. Because with the infix operator notation, I can't tell how things hang together. And there's something called operator precedence in many, well, in arithmetics and also in many programming languages. You need to remember that the multiplication and division bind more strongly than addition and subtraction. In German we say Punktrechnung vor Strichrechnung. I don't think you say that in Norwegian. <laughs> Trickbereinigung für Streckbereinigung. No, but so that means that the multiplication and the division, which we actually write as this symbol, <laughs> have a stronger operator precedence. They bind more strongly than plus and minus. So we might write this something like this. We don't need that notion of operator precedence. We don't need to think about the bracketing in these fully parenthesized prefix expressions in Lisp because it's already there. It's clear that this sub-expression is something that needs to be computed before the division. And that's clear because I said whenever we encounter a list that's interpreted as a function call. The first element will be interpreted as the name of a function. All remaining arguments will be evaluated and their values will be given to the function call. So as we evaluate this list, the second element in this list, the first argument, is a list. So it's itself a compound statement and recursively the same rules of computing apply. To compute the value of this list, I interpret the first element as a function and evaluate the remaining elements. Both are atoms, they're both numbers, they evaluate to themselves, so this gives me 10 plus 20. Now, finally, I can call the addition function. It gives me 30, I substitute that for this sub-expression. I evaluate the final element in the top-level list, it's a number, it evaluates to itself, so that gives me 30 divided by 2, 15. This is how this fully parenthesized prefix notation is a very um, powerful, I was going to say, elegant, well, that's in the eye of the beholder. Um, it's, it's a very adequate way of writing nested expressions because the way I write them gives me the ability to have variable numbers of arguments and it leaves no uncertainty about the order of computation. Um, White space is not meaningful. I can use indentation and line wrapping to make complex statements more readable. Um, so that was essentially the syntax of Lisp. Atoms, numbers, strings, Boolean constants, and symbols, and lists, which are interpreted as function calls. Now let's talk about the semantics and essentially we have said most of what we need to know about the semantics of the language at this point. Um, you know almost all there is to know about the rules of common lisp, the rules in the sense of um, well, what is the semantics of a programming language. That's the system of rules, the specification, if you will, that determines how a given program leads to a sequence of computation and a result. Very high level, very abstract. So, 
the semantics of a programming language means there it needs to be clear to the computer and the programming how some statement a small expression or a large program in that programming language will be executed and what result will um, come out of that computing. And so the semantics of common lisp is defined in terms of these evaluation rules that I have given you. That's the functional point of view. All we have are expressions, symbolic expressions, and every one of them when executed, when computed, is evaluated, that is, it has its value computed. That's effectively what we have done already. For lists, um, these correspond to function invocation, and the remaining elements of the list are evaluated, and the function is actually given their values as its arguments. Then later on next week we'll talk about a few, no actually today already, we'll talk about a few exceptions to these, to this very basic rule of, of evaluation which are called special forms and they can define their own evaluation rules. Why would we ever want to deviate from this evaluation strategy? Oh, that's a hard question to ask. So we'll introduce condition, what we call conditional evaluation. It essentially means if, then, else. And that's the kind of program where you want to test something and then depending on the result of that test you want to either do that or that. And to achieve that effect we need to relax for a special form called if these rules of evaluation that apply to all functions. So most of the expressions, most of the complex, the non-atomic expressions we'll see will be function calls and there will be a small finite list of special forms where there are, which are free to define their own rules of evaluation. Um, okay, we're, we're done. We could stop here. I've told you everything you need to know about the syntax of Lisp and the semantics. Atoms and lists. Lists are parenthesized prefix notation expressions. The semantics is defined in terms of evaluation. Um, that's in a sense what McCarthy did. But now to actually use that as a programming language we need an inventory of sort of the standard tools. For example, Plus and um, addition and division um, are predefined functions. They're part of the standard library. As is, well, there are, what is it, 1200 or so predefined functions. That's the large um, standard library of Lisp. But of course, we'll want to define our own functions. And to do that, we actually need to introduce the first special form. And that's called defun, define function. And that has the general form, function name, a list containing parameter names, and then one or more as expressions that are the body of the function. Here's an example. Um, a function that takes two arguments, which it calls x and y, and computes the average. And it does so by adding x and y and dividing by two. So this is the body, the actual computation, these are the parameters, the parameter names I can use in the body. Defun function name. Why is this a special form? What would happen if defun were a regular function? How would it be, how would this S expression be evaluated? Let's recall the rules of evaluating lists. I would use the notation earlier by summing the elements. Oh, all right, but um, let's let's apply the rules. Uh, you're on to something, but it's not directly answering the question I'm trying to ask. So let me let me repeat the question. So I've told you what Lisp does 
whenever we type a list, a symbolic expression that is a list, that is one that starts with an opening parenthesis into the read eval print loop. It evaluates it. It evaluates it according to the standard rules. What are the standard rules of evaluation? So it would try to evaluate, you're saying the inner parenthesis, first I'm just repeating for the, for the screencast, um, and that wouldn't work because Exactly, X and Y are not defined. It would actually fail even before then. So if we look at this as a complex S expression that we want to evaluate and pretend that it's a function. So we don't know that defun is what I call a special form. Hence we apply the standard rules of evaluation and those say the first element is Exactly. So the standard rules of evaluation say the first element in the list names a function. That may still be the case. But before we call that function, we evaluate, we compute the values for all of the remaining elements in the list. So we move on and say, okay, um, what's the value of average? What type of data is average? It's a symbol. Strings have double quotes. So this is a symbol, an identifier. And symbols evaluate to the value that has been assigned to them, to th that they're bound to. Average, I can tell you, doesn't have a predefined value. It's like foo. In fact, defun, the point of defun is to associate a value with the symbol average, to give it, make it a function definition. So in a, in a fresh lisp, average, the symbol doesn't have a value. Evaluating average will give an error. If we ignored that and said, let's move on, the next thing, the next element in the the fun list that would be evaluated is the list containing x and y. So we encounter a list, the rules of evaluation apply recursively. We want to evaluate that list. So, wha list, so what, we, what do we do? We assume the first element is the name of a function. We evaluate all remaining elements. That means y is a symbol. We ask for its value. It doesn't have a value. Error. Let's assume we ignored that. Then we call x as a function. There's no function named x. So error after error after error. Hence, and what we're trying to do here is not to evaluate the symbol average or the call the function x on the value of y. We're trying to define a function. This is program code. And hence, defun is our first special form. It deviates from the standard rules of evaluation. It doesn't evaluate any of its arguments. It rather establishes a new binding for the symbol average and will record that average is the name of a function that takes two parameters, which internally will be called x and y, and that when called executes the following computation, the body. So. That's why defun has to be a special form. Um, once I've done that, I can use it, just like the pre-built, um, the, the built-in predefined functions. I can now compute the average of 10 and 20. Um, so that was our first trivial function definition in Lisp. And to do that, we had to introduce our first special form, defun. Um, now let's briefly put this into the perspective of the history of functional programming. How many of you have taken INF 2810 here at the department in the bachelor? Oh, okay. That's at least half. So all of this will be, um, I hope, reassuring repetition to you guys. Um, um, we're not using common list, we're using scheme in that class, but um, that's a functional programming class. So a um, classic example to introduce functional programming is the factorial function, example from math. Um, so we're using numeric examples today, even though we want to move on to symbolic computation soon enough. The definition of the factorial is that the factorial of n is defined, so it's defined for um, integers, well, for the natural numbers including zero. 
and it's defined as 1 if n equals 0, so factorial of 0 is 1, otherwise as n times factorial of n minus 1. That's a recursive definition. You recognize that. It's recursive because the factorial function is part of its own definition. How can we... So it calls itself. Um, and how can we translate that into Lisp? It's one-to-one. -one. We can even use... Um, so I, I haven't told you that in the syntax of Lisp that exclamation points are special, hence we can just use exclamation point as the name of a function. So far we have two special characters, the double quotes and the parentheses. Everything else, for now, we can assume we can use as the name of a function. So exclamation point is just a symbol. I can define a function that I call exclamation point. It takes one parameter that I call m. And now I say in the body, um, if n equals 0, then return 1. Else, compute n times factorial n minus 1. That's a direct translation of the mathematical definition into a Lisp defund statement. You can kind of, so I, I'm using some functions here that I haven't introduced. Uh, multiplication, subtraction, those are good. Um, the equal sign here means test for equality between your arguments. So it corresponds to the mathematical equal sign over there. And then I'm using if here. And that's the example I mentioned earlier already. If is going to be our second special form because it takes the form of a list, but it's the kind of expression where we surely don't want to evaluate all of the arguments. It's not a function. It's not a, 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 a standard function. It's something that we use to branch in the stream of computation where the first thing we want to evaluate is the first argument, the test. And then depending on whether this test returns true or false, we want to execute, we want to evaluate one of the two remaining arguments to if. So we'll formally define this, but let's accept it for now here in the, in the definition of, of factorial. Um, this is the one-to-one -one translation of the mathematical definition. Um, how many of you feel that you're not comfortable writing recursive functions? Haven't done it much? Very few. Um, there's nothing, I mean, this may seem circular. We define a function and we use that same function in the body of the function definition. Um, what we need to make sure, as you might recall from uh, learning to write recursive functions, is that we avoid endless circular loops. And in the definition of the factorial, we do so by reducing the problem say size in each recursive call. So we could reason over the mathematical definition that n upon each recursive call of factorial is going to have a smaller value than the current n. So we work towards zero. We're sort of guaranteed that n eventually, after n recursive calls, will actually become zero. And at that point, we reach what is called the base case and we terminate. No more recursion. So that's a, a vital property of recursive functions that this one satisfied. And hence, um, as long as there's a base case, um, computation will eventually terminate and return a value. And to contrast this functional definition of the factorial function with one um, that is in style, what yeah, I think you can call imperative, progr imperative programming, um, this would be Python, where you introduce a local variable for the result, initialize it to one, then execute a loop of assignments where for um, where n times the loop decrements n in each um, iteration, you multiply r um, with, or you compute 
a new value for r from its current value times the current n and eventually you return r. Does this seem natural to you? It does, that's sad. <laughs> no, that's, that's not unnatural, but um, in a sense, if you contrast them, this is, is the sort of one-to-one -one translation from the mathematical definition, whereas this is, um, is, is, is a slightly different computation that comes to the same result. And arguably, this is more effort. Well, no, m more coding effort, more complexity. Yes? It isn't. How does the so is the exclamation point predefined as the question as a factorial function? It isn't. And then you're saying, how does this work? Why should it not work? It's an important question. Yes, so while we are defining the factorial, we actually use it in its own definition. That's the circular nature. That's what makes this function a recursive function. But because the defun is a special form, it doesn't evaluate anything. All that happens is that defun says exclamation point, point, you become the name of a function. You're the kind of function that takes one argument. How do we know that? There's one symbol in the argument list. And you can refer to that argument, whatever you're given, as n internally. When called, you shall execute the following, or sh you shall evaluate the following symbolic expression, which is the body of the factorial definition. So um, that's all that the defund does. It says this symbol, exclamation point, shall become the name of this um, one argument function, and that function computes the following S expression. By the time we actually call the function, that definition is in effect. And so when the body of the factorial function is actually used, the exclamation point has its definition. That's why this works. Okay, um, we're approaching, we're fast approaching the coffee break, but let me go through this and then we'll have earned our first coffee break. Um, we won't go into the fine points of, of, of any of this. Um, for those who have taken a, an introduction to functional programming, um, this is repetition. Um, but you might worry that the recursive nature of the factorial definition um, is expensive to compute. Lisp, for the longest time, had a reputation of um, sort of heavily encouraging recursive definitions, and that's true. And recursive procedures for many decades had a reputation of being expensive or slow to compute. That was true to a certain degree. Um, hence, there is a way of translating the uh, Lisp um, implementation of the factorial into something that more closely resembles the actual sequence of computations in the imperative and the Python version, where we use a helper procedure. So we say factorial of n calls factorial dash args. That's a separate function that we define down here. And that is a function that takes three arguments. That's the um, so-called accumulator variant, where the um, first argument is going to be the result, the second argument is the counter, and the third argument is the n, the sort of upper bound for the computation to stop. So we say when i, the counter, becomes larger than n, the upper bound, then just return r. We're done. Otherwise, Again, a recursive uh, function, so bang args, factorial args, calls itself, and it multiplies r times the current i. It increments i, so it moves the counter one step closer to n, and it preserves n. Um, 
So this will um, count upwards from r initially 1, i initially 1, and then it will count i upwards towards n. And once i exceeds n, then it will return r, and at each step it will multiply, it will, um, it will stepwise compute that factorial product. Um, all right, I could have walked you through um, these steps um, using color coding here. The difference to the original factorial definition, if we go back briefly, is that here the factorial is a, the, the recursive call is a sub-expression in a larger expression. So here the multiplication needs to wait for the recursive call to terminate. Only then can it compute the product, the multiplication with n. Difference here is that the recursive call is here to be is here said to be in what is called the tail position. There's no one in this local computing environment in the body of bang args waiting for the return of the recursive call. Whatever comes back from the recursive call will be returned by the function at large. That's because if is a special form, not a function. If evaluates test first and then either one of the then or the else. If we've decided to evaluate the else, we evaluate the recursive call and whatever comes back can be returned from the current function. That's the difference. No one's waiting for that result locally. And that enables, so no work remains to be done in the calling function. And um, once we reach the base case, we have computed the product, we just return the current value of R. And um, that enables a compiler optimization called tail call optimization, which means the compiler can actually generate code for this um, that um, executes as an iterative loop. No nested function calls, no overhead in... Um, there's, there's a certain cost to calling a function, obviously. If you've... Anyone taken compiler construction? Not many. None, maybe. <laughs> so calling a function, there's a certain cost. You need to push the parameters on the stack. You need to find the, the, the jump address, essentially. You need to branch program execution to another part of the code segment. The actual function needs to get its arguments from the stack, compute something, push the result onto the stack. That's what happens when you call a function. So there's a certain overhead to calling a function. Hence, a recursive function definition will bring with it that overhead as many times as it calls itself recursively. Tail recursion, so a limited special case of recursion, enables the compiler to... So w we can still write recursive code because that's often a natural way of stating the problem. There are problems that lend themselves to a recursive approach. But the compiler can transform a re tail recursive um, function into something where that calling overhead is eliminated. And I suggest we take a break here, come back in 15 minutes, 11.18, and I'll say I have one more slide on tail recursion and then we'll move on. Um, welcome back. Um, it's a bit in the nature of these first introductory lectures that we throw out a lot of stuff. And, and if you've um, not thought about, not heard about tail recursive procedures before, then let that sink in for a few more days. Um, I have some more material, lots more material. I I would like to go through this week to enable you to start work on, on our first programming exercise. So as is one of the challenges in, in introducing a, a programming language up front quickly is that I, I kind of need to get through uh, a shopping list of, of topics and just get 
get all of that out and in front of you. So to wrap up on tail recursion, um, um, this, is an, uh, this is an attempt at visualizing the computational difference. So the original, the elegant one-to-one -one translation um, version of the factorial function, factorial of seven will essentially give rise to this chain of computation. To compute the factorial of seven, the first thing I need to compute is the factorial of six. That calls for the factorial of five. And while I have yet to compute the factorial of five, these two multiplications are pending, they're waiting. They will only be executed once this sub-expression has returned, once I know the value for the factorial of five. That starts to happen down here. So factorial of one hits the base case. Um, I think I'm missing one here because the base case is defined for zero. Um, and I start returning values for this last. And so here we now see that this product is growing. That's the factorial. And eventually I return a value. And what I see here visually is this nested um, um, tree of um, layer upon layer of recursive function calls. That's where the overhead is looking. This is not terrible. This, this can be a fine computation. Just something to keep in mind. To motivate the benefit of the tail recursive variant where this recursive call here in the body of bang args is no one's waiting for that. We'll immediately return the value. And that means that I can trace the sequence of computation for bang arg, for bang of seven, factorial of seven, will call out to the helper function, bang args, with initial values one, one, seven. And then this first parameter here, r, is where the product grows from the beginning, at each step. And the counter increments, and once the counter exceeds n7, this is the number, current value of r, that is immediately returned. So no waiting computation, no overhead due to the recursive, the waiting, the pending recursive call environments. That's the difference, that's the motivation for us to think about these accumulator variants where essentially the difference is that I add parameters in the helper function which allow me to accumulate the result, the thing I'm computing, underway one by one as I work towards the result. Whereas here the result is only computed as all of the recursive calls unwind. Um, that's all I want to say about the difference between recursion and, 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 and tail recursion. Um, as I say, often we'll write simple recursive functions because that's a straightforward, elegant way of capturing the problem. And it's only in, in critical code that we might want to sort of concern ourselves with this additional optimization technique. Um, so with that brief excursion into the fine points of functional programming and recursive functions, let me move on more about the fine points of the semantics of Lisp. And that's essentially introducing a few more special forms. Most of the special forms we'll actually need. And so we've said that uh, lists represent program and data, but we've also said whenever a list is encountered by the interpreter, when I type it into the REPL, it's going to be evaluated. So if I wanted to use a list as data, I somehow need to suppress evaluation. And there is a special form, the quote operator, which I can write as simply a single quote. So that's the third special character I give you. Double quotes for strings, parentheses for lists, now the single quote to suppress evaluation. Type in P, we know that already, the value comes back. I type in quote P or quote P. These are two syntactic variants of the same expression. So just putting a quote in front of some 
S expression is a shorthand notation for wrapping that S expression in a list where the first element is the symbol quote. This is the common shorthand notation, but it really comes down to this underlying S expression. That means don't evaluate your argument. So quote takes one argument and it returns that argument unevaluated. That's a way of just getting back the symbol. Say I want to represent the name of that constant as a symbol. We know that I type in foo bar, it doesn't have a value that gives an error. I type it in quoted, I get that same symbol back. So this is a way of representing data, symbolic data, um, and preventing the evaluation of symbols. A list will be interpreted as a function call. I can suppress evaluation. So this is a way of representing the arithmetic expression 2 times pi, rather than computing it. Yes? No. There are symbolic expressions. But this, so this is a list. The, this is an object that is a complex symbolic expression, namely a list. It's just returned without, so the object, the data is returned rather than interpreted as program or as code and evaluated. So interpreting something as code means evaluating it. Using it as data means not evaluating it, using it just to represent what it is. So you might say this is a list that maybe I interpret as a set containing two symbols, the star, that's just a symbol, and pi, and one number. Or I use this as data that represents a numeric expression, but it's not computed, it's not evaluated. Um, the empty list, I cannot evaluate, because interpreting that as a function call, I would be looking for a function name, and there is no function name here. But I can use the quote operator to suppress evaluation, and so this is my way of representing an empty sequence. So quote, um, typically written with just the single quote, suppresses evaluation. And to do that, it has to be a special form, obviously. Because if it were not, if quote were a regular function, then this expression would be evaluated according to the standard rules of evaluation, which are evaluate all of the arguments first. So we would try to evaluate pi, that would give us a number, and at that point it would be too late to actually just return the unevaluated symbol. Okay, so that's quotation. Um, and reflecting a little more on that, um, as expressions are used to represent data and code, mono-iconic, um, that nice property of Lisp, uh, which means lists have a double role. Their function calls, as we see here, and using a list where the first element doesn't name a known function will result in an evaluation error, in an exception. But I can use lists as data to represent the pair of the symbols foo and bar. And I do so by just writing down the list using quote or an alternative way of writing down the list, of, of building the list containing the symbols foo and bar would be to use the list function. And that takes any number of arguments and it will just accumulate its arguments as a, as a list. Why do I have to put the quote mark here though? What would happen if I don't? Yes. I said list function. Very good. And that means it would first try to evaluate its arguments. And foo and bar may not have a value, error. Or even if they did, what I want to do here is a list containing the symbols foo and bar, not a list containing their values, if any. So I need to suppress evaluation here. I'm talking about the symbols as data rather than as program variables that have values. Um, all right, so that was our, our high-level introduction to lists as code and data and quote 
as essentially the technique, the special form we use to um, pick one or the other side of that um, uniform syntax for code and data continuum. Now let's talk a little more about the data structures and operations and the name of the language betrays um, one central data structure that it had from the beginning. And in the late 1950s, a programming language that had a built-in list data type was rich, high-level, special. <laughs> We've come to sort of take that for granted, of course. Um, but it was sort of so remarkable that it became part of the, the programming language's name. So LISP um, stands for list processing. And that means we need a number of operations to manipulate lists. So often when we have data that is sequential in nature, where there is some linear ordering, or even hierarchical ordering, we will use lists to represent that data. And the Lisp compilers are very good at generating efficient code for list manipulation. So to build lists and to destructure them to take out things again. The three core fundamental functions are cons for construct and first and rest to destructure them. And to build a list from the ground up, I could say I use the cons function and the symbol nil, which in Lisp is overloaded. We've already mentioned it as the Boolean truth value false, but it also um, represents an empty list. So what this means is cons is a function, it takes two arguments. The first argument is anything, an object. The second argument is a list, which can be the empty list. It makes its first argument the new first element in front of the second argument, that list. And if I do that three times, then I build up the list containing one, two, and three. So cons 3 nil gives me what? The innermost call? What's the return value of consing 3 onto nil, which is the empty list? A list of one element, very good. Where that element is 3, <laughs> obviously. So cons 3 one object and the empty list gives me a single list, as we will often say, a list containing only that object. That's the difference. An object and a list containing that object are two different things. Um, I cons together, so now I, I write that list here in a much more compact. I, one would never write those nested cons statements. So a much more compact way of, of representing a constant list containing three numbers would be to just write it down and quote it. This is data. I can cons zero onto it and that gives me a new list where zero is the new first element. W the zero is data, why don't I have to quote it? Because It's self-evaluating. I could actually quote it, but the effect would be the same and it wouldn't really imp increase readability. So the numbers evaluate to themselves. I don't need to quote them. Um, first, now it's the inverse. It takes out, it returns the first element, given a list. Rest is the complement to first. Given a list, it returns everything but the first element. So first and rest correspond to the first and second arguments of cons. Um, I can nest these, of course, and this will return two. Very good. Um, I can rest, 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 and that will return. I hear three. Or the empty list. Uh, rest gives me everything but the first element. So if I take out the first element three times, and I have three elements, then I'm left with the empty list. So rest takes me here, takes me here, takes me here. So rest is the, well, first and rest are the, the inverse of, um, of cons. 
From these three, I can derive a whole library of list operations, for example, one that we've seen already, or appending, concatenating any number of lists, or computing the length, or reversing a list. All of these are built in, and many more. Taking the nth element, where, of course, McCarthy counted zero-based. I mean, how could there be any ambiguity about how one should count positions in a sequence? The first element is, of course, at position zero, at index zero. So, um, nth, an index, a position, and a list will give us the list element at that index. So, zero, one, two are the positions. So, nth two gives us the third element, the element at position two, at index two. Yes? Yes. No. So those who have done Scheme or Emacs Lisp, um, for historic reasons, um, there are, so first and rest are also known, and I think Cybel actually uses these names, right? So car, which really abbreviated contents of address register, contents of decrement register, so that was an early Lisp compiler where these were sort of they mapped to specific registers on that machine um, and somehow they they've stuck around in the programming language and nowadays they are grandfathered in um, and they're just part of the, 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 the Lisp jargon. I never used them, so I'll talk about first and rest because I find that much more readable but you'll see car as essentially a synonym for first and cudder as a synonym for rest. And in fact, you can do creative things using car and cudder. So there's a predefined function cudder, which is the car of the cudder. But really, the only readable way of writing that is to spell it out first rest. So cudder of x really is the first of the rest of x. Yes? Uh, in this case, yes. What you could do, could do, do, do. But I have, 20 years ago, abandoned these. And sort of in my own code, I limit myself to first and rest. And when I actually have to do something like that, then either I nest them or I use a function like nth. Yes, cutter, the first of the rest, is the equivalent of, what did you say, nth? Exactly. And so nth index 2 would be the first of the rest of the rest. So as many rests as the index actually tells us, because that jumps over one position. So we won't dwell on the many predefined list operations. The Cybel chapters sort of lay them out for you. And um, I think in the first exercise and the first laboratory, we actually see how you can easily define some of these often as recursive functions using cons first and rest. Yes? You're asking how does the compiler implement nth? We don't have to know that. But um, um, in fact, we can speculate about that um, in a minute. Um, last example on this slide, there is a predefined function last and that actually returns the last rest. So you might have thought that would be the last element, um, but it isn't. It's defined to be the last rest. So in a sense, last is a sort of nth rest. nth is the, with an index, uh, the first, the element at that position, and last will, have, will give us the innermost non-empty list. And then if I actually wanted the last element, the idiom is to say first of last. Yes? No, I think if you call last on a singleton list that only contains one element, it will give you the last non-empty rest, okay. which should be the list itself. I can't honestly say I have ever done that, but <laughs> um, and last on an empty list is 
surely defined as the empty list. Um, rest of the empty list is the empty list. So all of these are fairly robust. You don't get exceptions. Um, you can take the first of an empty list and it returns an empty list to you. Um, so briefly on the internal structure, since in a sense you were asking about that, I prepared a slide to answer your question um, in my infinite wisdom. And this is how lists are internally um, represented. They're really chains of cons cells. And a cons cell is a pair of two pointers, even though Lisp doesn't have pointers as a data type. Um, we can often, we'll often talk about pointers because it's, it's, it's the right metaphor. It's a good way of, of understanding um, the internals of the data structures. And as we'll move to writing our own programs that actually manipulate very large data structures, these choices will often matter. So we will actually ask and concern ourselves with implementation efficiency at the level of, of memory usage. How much memory does a list of 10,000 elements consume? And from this we can at least say it's going to use 10,000 cons cells. Lists are what is in, in sort of theoretical computer science, or general computer science called uh, singly linked lists. They have a next pointer to the next element and a pointer to the current element, and each such structure represents a sublist. Eventually I need to terminate that using nil, which designates the empty list. And here we see the one-to-one -one correspondence between this. So that's, that's inside the computer's memory. There are eight objects which are of type cons cell. Each has a first and a rest. The rests always point to another list, which can be the empty list. The firsts always point to an element. I can represent a nested list, so the list, how many elements are in that list on, the, on this side, this list? One, four, two. So between one and four. Let's give the right answer. <laughs> Zero? <laughs> You're guessing. Let's just count. So the top level list is the outermost pair of parentheses. And then within that list are the elements. The first element of that list is what? That's a list. So that's one. And the next element is? the number three. So that's two. And the next element is? Well, that's not an element. That's the end of the list. <laughs> so there are two elements in the top level list, of which one is a list. And we actually see that here in the cons tree. This is the first element of the top level list. And in this case, the pointer actually points to a cons cell which represents another list. And that list contains one and two, and then is terminated. So this whole substructure here is one element in the first position of the top level list, and then there is another one. Um, there's nothing, I think sometimes people walk away from these first lectures with the impression, oh, there's something magic going on here, or <laughs> he makes it so special. There's nothing special about this. This is <laughs> we're just trying to be precise, maybe unusually precise in talking about data types and how they they are sort of built up from smaller pieces and about um, terminology and um, the, the the fragments which we put together, the symbolic expressions to build. Uh, programs. You could apply the same sort of semi-formal, mathematically minded, if you will, or formally sort of precise, I think we could say, um, perspective on, on, on other programming languages. It's just not typically how you're introduced to a programming language. Um, so that was a, a brief sort of visual exploration of what is inside the machine. So lists are represented as 
uh, nested chains of cons cells, pairs of pointers. Um, now let's move on. What we haven't discussed so far is value assignment. And um, how does a symbol receive a value? And one way to um, associate a value with a symbol is the special form def parameter, and that is used to declare global variables. And as a syntactic convention, nothing else. It is Lisp folklore to put asterisks, these stars, around the names of global variables. The star here is not on our short list of special characters so far. Which characters are on that list? The double quote for strings, the parenthesis for lists, and the quote. So, so far we have three special characters that we know we cannot use in symbols. There will be three more or so, but uh, most everything else, including the exclamation point or the star here, um, that's just a regular character. And I can use it as the name of a symbol. So star foo star is a symbol, just as exclamation point is a symbol. And it's a syntactic convention. It has no meaning to the compiler to the semantics of the program. It's something that many Lisp programmers sort of adopt to flag the names of global variables, symbols that have a global value binding by putting stars around their name. So this just means assign a value, 42 in this case, to the symbol star foo star. And once I've done that, I can now evaluate star foo star and it returns its value, yes. Could we escape the special character? Yes, but um, there are so few. You're asking, could I have a symbol that contains the quote mark? Yes, I can do that. But then I need to learn the escape syntax for symbol names. And look that up in the Cybel book. But yes, we have that flexibility. Um, but I'm not sure it would really help with the readability of our program. So we could have a symbol that is whose name is quote F-O-O. <laughs> but that would, I think, be more confusing than helpful. Um, the generalized way of, um, of value assignment is the special form setf. Um, and that takes two arguments, a uh, place designator, so where I want to record that value and the an S expression that will be evaluated and become the value. And place can either be a variable named by a symbol, what we have done so far, or it can be any storage location. So for example, once I've done that, star foo star is a global variable, I can reassign its value. I can say, now make the value of star foo star the result of evaluating this as expression. That means adding one to the current value. And then star foo star will have the value 43. So that's one way of writing an increment. Or since we don't declare types, um, so Lisp is what is called a dynamically typed language. Um, we didn't have to say anything about the type of values that the global variable star foo star can hold. And hence we are free to say, actually, new value of star foo star is a list, so a list containing three numbers. Um, nothing to stop us from that. Um, and once I've done that, I can now actually also use setf with a first argument that is not a variable, but a storage location, namely the first element of a list. And I can put a new value there. Now, once I've done that, I'm effectively correcting so obviously, my intention here was to make it the list containing 1, 2, and 3, since we're doing teaching examples. And using setf on the first of that list means I can put a new value into that position, into that place. If we go back briefly to this diagram, then setf first of that top-level list would mean change this pointer here. <coughs> 
make that point from whatever it points to currently to something new, to a new value. So the first and rest of lists are what we call storage locations. Uh, valid um, first arguments to set a valid place designators. And we'll have to learn, of course, what are valid place designators. We'll talk about arrays and then each cell in an array will be a place designator. Um, we'll have structures, object-like um, objects, and then the components will be um, places that I can use with setf. Um, Okay, so that was briefly set up. I think I'll actually have to skip this overview. It's essentially um, predefined um, assignment operators, for example, to increment or yeah, to increment by some step or just increment by one or decrement and to use lists like stacks. Um, I actually have predefined um, 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 specialized assignment operators, but all of them correspond to expressions that we could write already, with one exception. Here we see something um, that we haven't seen yet. Um, um, uh, let, and that's the next thing I want to throw out in this tour de force. Um, everything you need to know about the Lisp basics to get started. So we've talked about def parameter for global variables. Um, we've talked about function parameters in defun. So far we have no mechanism to introduce a local variable somewhere inside a function, let's say. And often it's going to be convenient to, I mean, global variables we will use very sparingly. We know that they are detrimental, they're not good for code modularity and whenever possible we'll want to keep variables local to where they actually need it. So the construct in Lisp to create a local variable is called let or its variant let star and they create a temporary value binding for one or more symbols. So for example assume that star foo star and star bar star are global variables with initial values. I can now say for the purpose of a local S expression, just for a short while, let star bar star actually have the value 7 and bas have the value 1. So that, that, that borrows from the definition you often have in, in math textbooks. Let x be a vector of length n. Um, and in the context, in the scope of this let expression now, I can evaluate an S expression and bas and star bar star and star foo star will be evaluated according to the current local uh, bindings. So what do we expect to get back here from adding current value of bas with the current value of star bar star and the current value of foo? So one plus this is the interesting question. So bas doesn't have a global definition. It has to be the local variable. Star bar star has a local binding and a global binding. Which one do we use? The one that is closest, of course, the local one. So the global binding is actually no longer visible to us as long as we're in the local variable definition. So this is 7. And foo, there's no local binding. So we need to look it up in the global environment. And foo's value is 42, and that takes us to 50. Very good. Star bar star? Unchanged, because this was a local temporary binding. As soon as we leave the let expression, um, this local temporary binding vanishes, has no effect any longer. And star bar star, the same symbol, goes back to its global binding. So what happens here? And bass doesn't have a value because it only had one within the let. What happens here is that the bindings, the local bindings, are valid only in the body of the let expression. Let takes as its first argument a list of pairs, 
each containing a symbol and a value, and then a body, just like a function. And it shadows in the sense of temporarily overrides any previously existing bindings that these symbols may have had. So that means in the scope of the let, star bar star has the innermost binding that I can find. And this shadowing can shadow, that is sort of temporarily override global bindings, but it can also nest lets inside each other. And then I effectively need to look out from where the symbol is used and find the innermost enclosing binding for that symbol. It's not so often that we actually want the same symbol with sort of different binding contexts. We're doing that here for the sake of, of exposition. Typically, I think one would, well, it all depends, but, but typically one would, of course, not use conflicting names and sort of give them different bindings in different contexts. It can sometimes be useful. but So let is a variant to establish local variables and they have a, a clearly defined scope. There's no ambiguity about where the bindings are in effect, where they're visible. That's within this pair of parentheses. So again, the syntax of Lisp, the fully parenthesized notation, makes the interpretation trivial, no uncertainty. Um, let star is just a variant that binds one after the other, whereas let will actually bind these in pseudo-parallel, that means um, they can't refer to each other in sequence. Uh, look that up in the Seibel book, it's a, it's a subtle difference. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll use my remaining four minutes to throw out a few more names essentially for concepts that you know before, from before that you've used in, in, in any programming language you've used. So we'll call a predicate a function that tests some condition that, is, that we use to determine a truth value. Um, where truth values in Lisp are fairly relaxed. Nil means false. True means, that is the symbol T means true. T means true. But everything that is not nil will also be interpreted as true. So there's false and everything else. That's often convenient. Um, and T is just a predefined constant symbol that we can use to, um, to, to designate true in the sense of non-nil. But we could equally use 42. 42 is means can be interpreted, when I interpret it as a truth value, um, it means true. It's, it's not nil, because it's not nil. So many predicates in Lisp have a P in their name. So Lisp P means test whether your argument is a list. I give it a list. It says, yes, that is a list. Um, Null doesn't have a P, um, but is a predicate. It tests whether its argument is an empty list. Is the rest of this list an empty list? No, it's the list containing two and three, so it's not the empty list. Even P tests whether a number is even, and there are dozens of predefined predicates. Um, here I say give foo the value 42, and then I use Boolean connectives and, or, and not to form complex predicates. And again, you're used to these. Um, I can say, is foo or either not a number or both greater or equal than zero and less or equal than 42. So these are predicates. Number p is a predicate. Uh, or, not, and and are the Boolean connectives. Again, in many programming languages, you need to learn that and binds more, that not binds more strongly than and, which in turn binds more strongly than or. So when you form complex Boolean expressions, you need to know how they are grouped. Not so in Lisp, because we parenthesize and spell out explicitly how these are grouped. So this and, I can just look at the parenthesis. This and applies to these two sub-expressions, this not to this one, and then the whole thing is in the OR. Um, in addition to these predicates, these sort of examples of predicates, 
testing for equality is of course a type of, of predicate and um, there are more than four but um, three that I think we'll frequently use and um, they're called EQ, EQL, equal I'll skip equal P for now and essentially the difference between EQ and equal is that of um, identity versus equivalence and what does that mean so two ways of writing down a list containing the three numbers one two and three so the same lists you might say but not the same objects hence they are not EQ they're not identical um, they are however equal they're equivalent they have the same structure and the same values. So EQ tests token identity, essentially the same object at the same location in memory. You might think pointer identity. Equal tests object equivalence. The same meaning, but as separate objects. And for efficiency reasons, EQ is actually not defined on numbers and characters and hence um, when the types of objects we are testing are numbers, then we need the variant of EQ that is called EQL. But two numbers of a different type, and I'll stop here, the integer 42 and the floating point number 42 are not EQL, but they are equal P. So again, these, these are sort of mathematically the same number, you might say, but not the same objects, because an integer and the floating point number cannot be the same object. Yes, final question. Okay, may or may not doesn't sound good. Ah, um, here you're guaranteed that when they are two different objects, then it's going to be false. And so, yeah, that depends on how the interpretation of object literals, ah, we're getting carried away, let's take that offline. <laughs> but there should not be ambiguity. And I'll wrap up here, I'll stop here in fact, and welcome you back next week to pour out what remains to be said about LISP. Thanks for today.